Life is way too short to focus on all that's wrong with the world. I'm Thomas Roberts. We're here for you. We love you. We see you. We hear you. We know you're there. So thank you for doing this, Thomas. This is Gay Good News. Give me 30 minutes and I'll give you a rainbow. Hey, everybody. It is great to have you with us. It is Thursday, July the 16th of 2020, and I'm really happy to see you. It's been a long time. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, it's been a long week and an interesting week. So we have a lot to catch up on, and I have some great interviews today, some wonderful pieces that I've been dying to show you. We put together a really funny tease. I don't know if you saw it of me floating around on a unicorn in the pool talking about speaking with uh, Jennifer Holliday. <laughs> and with Rob Kearney. Now, Rob, you might know as the world's strongest gay, and you could have been following his story on Snapchat as they just had the world's strongest man home edition on Snapchat. It's the first time they've ever done that, and it's because the world's strongest man competition, well, it got delayed because of COVID. Now, I'm gonna explain more about that coming up in a minute, but there is another big story uh, that I wanted to tell you about that's been getting a lot of acclaim and deserves a lot of acclaim and it also deserves, deserves some party noises. Uh, go party noise. Yeah. Uh, this is Valentina Sampio. She is the Brazilian model that is being featured in Sports Illustrated, the swimsuit edition, and she is the first transgender model to do so. Now this young lady has broken many barriers already in her early career uh, by appearing on many magazines that have typically shunned a transgender model. Uh, but this is really a big first, not only for Sports Illustrated, but for this young lady and for uh, the, the transgender community that's uh, having a big summer already with what we saw from uh, the Supreme Court last summer. Uh, a lot of people might say it's about time. It's about damn time. You know, I think the other big story this week was Viola Davis, uh, you know, on the cover of Vanity Fair and a black woman who had a black photographer and they were touting the fact that they finally had a black photographer for Vanity Fair in 40 years. That's kind of embarrassing. And it's kind of embarrassing to think that Sports Illustrated hasn't had a transgender model uh, be included in its swimsuit edition before. Uh, but now we have seen that moment in history come and go. Uh, and this is a really, really uh, exciting moment for Valentina. I wrote to her to try to get her to talk to me. She has a, a locked Twitter account, so you can't get you know you can't get her and see her tweets. Uh, but I tried, uh, and if she writes me back, which I hope she does, I will get it on for you. Uh, now the other big news is that Scotland is officially the first country uh, that is going to be having uh, that deserves a fall too. The LGBTQ curriculum installed for the fall semester. Now that all depends on COVID nineteen, obviously. We have our own issues here, whether kids are going to go back to school in the fall or they're going to be doing Zoom school. Uh, we'll wait to see how everything cracks out by the end of summer. Uh, Scotland, I'm sure, is in the same boat. But part of their curriculum will be to start teaching about LGBTQ history, which is major. I mean, that's a major advance forward when you think about uh, the contributions of the community and the fact that uh, they'll now be included, you know, uh, and uh, think about that. I mean, think about all those kilt-wearing Scots, you know? Just think about it. Anyway, it's going to be good. Uh, now, I take you to this. This is the big intro that I wanted to set up for the world's strongest gay. That's his name. Yeah, that's what he goes by, Rob Kearney. Uh, he is a great guy. He's just 28 years old, and he is an out professional athlete. And maybe you've seen or heard part of his story. Uh, he's been around for a little while, coming out in 2014 and just blazing on the scene and becoming the world's strongest man in kind of nothing flat. Meet Rob. I am really excited now to present to you the world's strongest gay, Rob Kearney, who is a professional strongman uh, and an all-around great guy. You probably watched him performing uh, on it's the world's strongest man home edition, right, Rob? Yeah, that was most uh, what was most Snapchat. recently going on on Snapchat. Yeah. So was that weird to be uh, performing? Because this was the just so everybody understands that that show was birthed because COVID canceled the competition later this year. 
So they decided they would do this home edition version of it. And you guys didn't have to compete face to face, right? Yeah, so it, it was totally strange. And, you know, yeah. we're still holding on to some hope that World's Strongest Man is supposed to happen in November. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, but they came up with this as to give athletes and the fans of the sport of strongman something to watch and something to have fun with. So right. pretty much our job was to take typical strongman events and turn them into things you can do at home two different events uh, the first was an overhead press for reps which i ended up throwing my husband joey in a chair and pressing him over my head for as many reps as possible in a minute um and then how, had many, to did do you get? A, how many how many did you get in a minute i think i got like 12 with him overhead pretty good how much does he weigh he's um i think like 185 right now all right all right so which is you know it's on the lighter side but it was awkward as heck because you know he's sitting in a chair sitting in front of my face yeah. um so it was just a really strange motion and then that? did you practice <laughs> or just you totally you just went in blind and hope that it worked <laughs> right. you gotta love that you know just keeping it live for the audience but yeah the, the reception i guess via snapchat you were reaching a whole new audience yeah, and that's that's something that's been amazing with the sport of strongman over the past few years is the sport as a whole has grown so much. And, you know, by doing it on Snapchat, kind of breaking into people that don't normally watch what we do, it gives them a little bit a little bit of an intro as to what the sport of strongman is and hopefully it brings a whole new fan base to what we do. So explain to all of us, how did you get involved with the 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 sport and then to turn pro? Yeah, uh, pure luck, to be honest. So I was a football player and cheerleader in high school and was actually working out in the weight room one afternoon when a, when a wait, teacher- so well, Wait, so hold on, wait, a football player and a cheerleader? So you're like, you know, you're on the field and then when you're getting benched, you're going to the cheerleading squad? <laughs> it was two separate seasons. All so right. I'd play football in the fall, then I would cheer in the winter for basketball and competition season. Um, so yeah, so I was working out in the weight room and, um, a teacher walked by who was actually also a CrossFit coach noticed that I enjoyed myself. And so I started going to the gym with him at five o'clock in the morning before school. Wow. I found out really quickly that I sucked at CrossFit, but I was good <laughs> at lifting heavy stuff. <laughs> so the, uh, the gym I, owner one day just you. kind of, I hate yeah, <laughs> it's bad on your knees. It's really bad on your knees. Well, you know, I guess picking up cars isn't exactly great either. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's different. Um, yeah. So one morning I walked into the gym and they were like, Hey, you know, there's, there's a straw man competition a couple of towns over and we signed you up for it and it's on Saturday. Um, so with about four days notice, I was 17 years old. I had no idea what the hell I was doing and jumped right into it and absolutely fell in love with the sport. I took dead last and really just kind of found my love for strength sports. And then from, that was 2009, so I was only 17 years old, and so really about, just um, and you're 28 now, right? 28 now, yeah. So it's been 11 years that I've been doing this, and I worked my way through the entire kind of amateur circuit here in the U.S. So I started actually competing under 200 pounds of body weight, and that was really just kind of get my bearings, learn the sport, mm -hmm. and then in 2013 I won the amateur national championships in the 231 weight class uh, to turn pro. I'm actually the smallest competitor. Um, so I'm five foot 10, about 285 pounds. And I like compete tank. against guys. You're like a tank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, a lot of people say I'm built like my dog because she's a bulldog. So short, stocky. And, you know. <laughs> is that glitter? We will get to that glitter. Is glitter. We'll get to yeah. glitter in the moment. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but then, you know, I compete against guys like, you know, if you're familiar with Game of Thrones, um, the mountain from the show, he's six foot nine, 440 pounds. That's crazy. It's and insane. So was he competing against you last year when you won? So at World Strong, so I won the Arnold Australia last year in March and he wasn't there. Um, but him and I did go head to head at World Strongest Man this past year um, back in 2019. And he beat me only by one point. Your moniker, though, is World Strongest Gay, right? Yes. Why did you pick that? So... I came out in 2014 um, after Joey and I had met and a friend of mine who was a writer reached out. He was like, you know, this is kind of a big deal. You're the first and only openly gay professional strongman. And honestly, that wasn't even a thought of mine when I came out. So he decided to write an article about it. 
it went pretty viral. Um, you know, and Joey and I had only been dating for about six weeks. The next thing you know, we're being asked to go on TMZ Live and Huffington Post and do all this stuff. Well, that's no pressure and for a couple. <laughs> none whatsoever. It's great. <laughs> So after Joey and I started dating and I came out and we we're given this kind of platform in the strength world, uh, we came up with the hashtag breaking the stereotype. And to us, that meant, you know, we were trying to change the way of what people think gay is. And, you know, I think all too often people think of gay men and they have to fit into this box and they stereotype gay men into being these effeminate, outgoing um, characters, really. And we wanted to, you know, kind of say, you know, that's not how everybody is. So changing the name to World's Strongest Gay, that was a big motivator as well. But then now that I've kind of advanced in the sport and my career has taken off, my big motivation is showing LGBTQ plus visibility in professional sports. I think it is so important. And I think it's something that isn't touched on a lot because, you know, thinking right now, there's a very strong women's presence when it comes to the LGBTQ community in professional sports. You know, right off the top of the head, you think of Megan Rapinoe, Sue Bird, all these amazing athletes. Martina Navratilova. And, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> really but then, you know, you yeah, can the list goes on and on. When we think about the men's side, it's really hard to think of openly gay men that are actively competing in their professional sports. No, it's and, very rare, very rare. The, the ones that we do have have waited until after uh, yes. they're finished pretty much. And you're at the, yeah. the, the, the height, the precipice of your career. Um, have you found, uh, the, I think the biggest reservation that we've heard from pro sports is that there's homophobia that exists in team locker rooms and in these different professional sports. Did you find that homophobia exists in the professional strongman world? You know, I'm really fortunate and it didn't. Um, strongman is such a niche sport. And mm -hmm. I think all of us understand what it takes to get to the level that we're at with the years of training and how hard we have to work to be one of the strongest men in the world. So fortunately, there's such a great community of camaraderie and brotherhood in the sport at the top level. That being said, um, when I did come out, and even to this day, I literally just got a message last night on Instagram, somebody just berating me saying, oh, why do you have to make it about your sexuality? Why do you have to be the world's strongest gay? You don't see so-and-so calling themselves the world's strongest straight. Um, and I get messages like that all the time, but it's not from people within the sport of strongman. Um, which is really amazing. You know, strongman is one where you're competing against somebody, but you're also cheering for them at the same time. Right. And I think that's been the beautiful thing about the sport is the relationships that I've, that I've gained through this sport and just the strength that it's given me mm -hmm. to not live in fear and to be unapologetically open about my sexuality, knowing that they're not the ones talking about me. Um, it's people that are from outside the sport or just don't understand the culture. So that, were you dating women before Joey? I did date a girl. Um, her and I dated for about a year and a half uh, when I was in college. And, you know, to this day, it's so funny that like everybody's like, oh, you know, what was it that made you come out? Why did you end that relationship? And I don't remember what it was. I literally, I remember the day like it was yesterday that I just woke up and I was like, this is not what I want. And I need to figure this out because um, I was having this internal battle with myself of trying to figure out my sexuality. So I woke up one day and just broke up with her. And I said, it's because, you know, I'm battling with this. I need to figure myself out. And, you know, I told her that it's because, you know, I, I believe that I'm gay. I need to explore these feelings and really figure out my sexuality. And, um, you know, just a few months after that, Joey and I met. So <laughs> it's wow. been pretty amazing. Yeah. So wait, you, 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 you only had one boyfriend and you got married. Yeah. Yeah. Joey and I have been together <laughs> since 2014. He's, uh, he's been, he's been by my side throughout this entire journey. Rob, you are an incredible ano anomaly, uh, not only for professional strongman or any pro sport, but also for the gay dating world. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an amazing, it's an, it's a great love story, but what gave you the confidence that you wanted to come out? What, what was it? It was Joey. Um, I was still closeted when him and I went, met and went on our first date. 
Uh, I was 22 years old. I had no idea what the hell I was doing <laughs> um, and really was just trying to figure out how to be happy. And that was the biggest thing for me, you know, because I think growing up in a, you know, kind of a, in a heteronormative way, it's exhausting waking up every day and pretending to be somebody you're not and carrying that burden throughout your entire life. Yeah. So him and I met and just you know, his energy, his confidence, his personality, just seeing how he was able to be himself and be so happy all the time, that really put me in a good place emotionally and mentally to come to terms with my sexuality and kind of proclaim my love for him throughout, you know, through the world. And, um, you know, another part of that is I, I didn't feel that it was fair for him to be 22 years old, to be dating somebody that was closeted when he'd been out since high school. You know, I'm, I'm weird. And in the fact that I was at this point in my life when I was 22, that I was so excited to finally feel happy, like genuinely happy for the first time that I did not care what came out of me coming out of, of the closet. Um, I didn't care what repercussions were on the other side. Mm -hmm. To me, it was about personal growth and me, you know, to be totally selfish, like I said, finally being happy right. um, because I didn't have to wake up and put that facade on every single day. I was able to just let my guard down, be myself. And in my mind, I just kind of had this F you mentality that if you didn't like it, you could leave and it wasn't going to bother me. Um, and that's kind of how I went about the entire coming out process, which was, you know, I'm super fortunate that all of my friends and family stuck by me and were super supportive of me. And, you know, I, I fully realized that not everybody is that fortunate. Um, but, you know, it definitely made me coming out a little bit, oh, a lot easier. <laughs> How long does it take to get your hair that way? So typically in the morning, it doesn't take too long to spike up. So it's only about five to 10 minutes. Um, typically when I'm competing, though, that's when I have the rainbow mohawk that's on the shirt right now. Um, and with that, to color it and get it all squared away, it's like four hours to bleach it and color it. So That's it is a painfully long process. How long have you been wearing your hair like this? So the mohawk has yeah. been on and off since like seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I, I started- Did you have a pair of Vans too? <laughs> uh, you know me so well. <laughs> Um, and then I actually started the rainbow. I started coloring my hair with rainbow um, for World Strongest Man last year because it was held in June for Pride Month. Um, knowing that it was in Florida last year during Pride Month, I kind of decided to take that extra step. You know, I typically compete in these crazy rainbow spandex all the time. Uh, that's kind of my signature thing. But then I really wanted to make a statement at World Strongest Man with it being Pride Month and, you know, just kind of being unapologetically me throughout the entire contest. Rob, I love it. Uh, and I wish you and Joey nothing but the best. Uh, and n for you, nothing but great health and continued strength until you peak at 32. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, take care. Bye bye. Thomas. Isn't he great? I mean, he is such a cool guy, and they have such a great love story. Uh, they met at 22, right? And they met through an app, and Rob goes on this date to meet Joey. And the next thing you know, they fall in love and, and they're together and they've been together ever since. I mean, it's really cool. Uh, and he trains all the time. He's a, a great guy. We talked about his diet, what it takes to sustain uh, that type of uh, energy for working out. Uh, and also the fact that there are other strong men. While he talked about the, the camaraderie there is in the sport, there are other strong men that are kind of gunning for him. They're gunning for his record right now. Uh, because he holds the uh, log lift title uh, as the strongest man in the world. It's amazing. They're like, you know, seven feet tall, the mountain, you know, from Game of Thrones. Can you believe that? Uh, so we go from the strongest gay in the world to probably one of the strongest, best, and I'm telling you, voices in the world. Uh, you know her as Effie from Dreamgirls on uh, Broadway. <laughs>
We're talking about the Lady Holiday, Jennifer Holiday. I had a chance to talk with Jennifer, and I got to tell you, it was one of my favorite interviews that I have ever done, ever. And we are so happy to welcome living legend, Broadway <laughs> sensation. Uh, what other great adjectives can I add? Uh, it's infinite. Jennifer Holiday is here. Hey, Jennifer. Hello, how are you? I'm great. It's so nice to finally meet you, at least oh, through yeah. the Zoom. Yes, through the Zoom. It's nice to meet you too. I've been such and a And we're fan. almost neighbors. We're I almost know. neighbors, sort of. We both live in Atlanta, Georgia. I know, we could have done this, you know, in person. Uh, <laughs> if the world wasn't like it is right now. If the world wasn't like it is, yes. Yeah. How have you been doing? I mean, it's, it's weird times. So how have you been coping? Well, I've been staying in. I have multiple cirrhosis, so I have a, a compromised immune system. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, you know, already I don't feel real every day. So um, I really just make sure, you know, that I don't have a lot of people around me and yeah. I just kind of stay in for right now, you know, until they can get us some uh, medication, you know, some yeah, vaccine. the vaccine. <laughs> yeah, I, I would or, imagine. I would imagine because of having that underlying condition, mm -hmm. uh, that it does make it, you know, a lot scarier. Uh, it does, and then I'm was, also, I'm and also the fact a that singer. we don't get the most information. I feel, you know, it changes right. on the daily. Right, and then Thomas, with me being a singer, um, and this is an uh, upper respiratory mm -hmm. illness. And from photos that I've seen um, from, and I've known uh, three people who've gotten it, two are still alive, one did die. And um, it goes straight to their lungs mm -hmm. and they show them a picture of their lungs and their lungs turn black, you know? And um, so, and then they say, uh, even afterwards, they still have, you know, some trouble, you right. know, breathing a couple yeah, of months later. <laughs> A lasting consequence from that and certainly as a singer you do not uh want to be messing around with anything like oh that. I, oh i really don't because if i you know number one with the compromise compromise immune system if i got sick then you have to if you had to do that ventilator mm -hmm. then that's almost like you know close to your vocal cords you know what i'm saying where they have to put it in so uh so i really i'm trying to take every precaution that i can well, and this really uh, must have uh, maybe an odd similarity to you uh, of what you lived through back in the 1980s uh, when you were in the smash hit Dream Girls on Broadway and a pandemic, the AIDS pandemic, uh, hit New York and uh, hit everywhere, but New York and Manhattan especially hard. Uh, this probably uh, feels similar. It feels somewhat similar, but I do feel that the AIDS, AIDS pandemic was more, more just sad and tragic because yeah. of the fact that they didn't know what it was in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So basically, it frightened everyone about everything, you know? And so they didn't have a name for it. And, uh, people were dying like every 15 minutes that we could count. And uh, it took a lot of most of the Broadway community uh, and it took most of the creative people from Dream Girls, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Bennett, Tom Ian, um, Michael Peters, Teddy Azar, um, some of the male uh, cast members and dancers all of them lost to AIDS. And the, the similarity almost in terms of the tragicness was of people having to die alone. And mm -hmm. since they don't, you know, allow people uh, right. to come and see you when you're sick, you know, um, with the coronavirus, it, it was more devastating with the um, AIDS pandemic because Back then, a lot of gay men were uh, in the closet, especially, you know, African-American men. Mm -hmm. And so we were calling people's families and mm -hmm. people 
didn't want them, you know? And everyone was so afraid of the, of what it would do that even funeral homes were afraid to take them. And they were just really disposing of bodies, burning of bodies. Um, and when I saw them digging those graves in New York, um, it almost had that eerie similar kind of feel, those masks when they were digging those mass graves because they were just burning people back then, you mm -hmm. know, because parents didn't want them because being gay was a sin. Right. And then the illness made it uh, also uh, you wearing a scarlet letter. Yeah. So extra I think stigma, that, yeah. extra stigma of attached yeah, to that it, existing so was, shame. So I think it was more devastating now because then, because now if you get this, you know, even if you're responsible, people get this the same even if they take the precautions or not it's just right, that it doesn't doesn't discriminate doesn't uh, discriminate yeah. so at least um it would have just a different kind of sigma i think back then that there's no there's just no comparison um in terms of the the devastation the heartbreak the tragedy and the great sense of inhumanity and also in christianity too of uh, people who turned their backs on just people who they didn't even know, but yet judged them and labeled them mm -hmm. and deemed them not worthy enough to live. For you personally, that has to be such a juxtaposition when you think about it, of that moment in time in your life where you are riding high. I mean, you are on Broadway, you're living out a dream, you're part of a you know, the dream girls in this show, and yet offstage you're dealing with friends dying. Uh, when, you think about, when you think about that time in your life, uh, does that blend in with those memories or is that compartmentalized in a different spot? How, did, how do you yeah. remember that time period, Jennifer? Yeah, it, actually it is compartmentalized in a different spot. Number one, because we had already had some uh, time of almost kind of like, again, with COVID, we had all had such time of joy and then all of a sudden shut down. You know what right. I'm saying? It's like, what well, for most people, what was it March 12th or March 20th here? You know, everything stopped. Um, so we had already been on our way. Myself, I, I was only, I had just turned 21 years old. So just being uh, a young turning a young woman, um, being the star of, you know, the biggest show on Broadway, we're dealing with the fact that, you know, we have um, uh, a, a responsibility also to our work and what we do and, mm -hmm. and dealing with the tragedy at the same time. And like I said, nobody knowing what it was, because back then they only called it the gay white man's disease. It didn't right. even have a name didn't even know what to do. So no one wanted to touch anybody. No one wanted to, you know, it was just very, like I said, devastating. And then there were just those of us who say, okay, wait a minute, we can't just let these people not get any help or, yeah. or just leave them to, to die. So I think that we didn't, it's, it's kind of, you know, kind of sad to say, say it like this because I don't really even know but the show must go on so yeah. you know it's it just you know and that's why it's so strange that Broadway is actually dark now I don't even know if they have a time in their history where they've been dark this long and will continue to be dark uh almost till you know they're saying January but it's probably definitely going to be till spring yeah, you know you, you've got to really feel for for those you know colleagues uh, of those uh, folks uh Broadway stars <laughs> You know, because you know what it's like to be part of a hit, to have that adrenaline, to have that sense of self and to know people are turning out because they want to see what you can do. Uh, but even if you're heartbreaking even, for a performer. Yeah, but Broadway is different. Even if you're not part of a hit and you're just on a good show <laughs> right. on Broadway, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You have a sense of community. You have a sense of we're all bringing joy to people we're doing right. something because it is broadway is a team effort so you do learn 
that it's not just about you uh, yeah. when you're in a Broadway show, that it even spreads to the ushers, to the doorman, to everyone. Everyone has a great sense of pride for their show, even yeah. if it sucks. You to know what working. I'm saying? They're even working. if it sucks. Yeah. It's all it, about the work. It's yeah. we're all sucking together. It works <laughs> together. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you just going to see how many more weeks before that notice goes up on that call board that the show is canceled or going to be the last week or the last run, you know? Is that the so, biggest fear? What's that like? What, what is that like to, to, you know, have to put on the best show every night? And as you're saying, the show, the show must go on. But is it a constant fear that lives in the back of your head uh, that that notice could go up at any time or, you know, you get canceled? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think that the life of, like, I'm a Broadway baby, and I think the life of the theater is that you are almost acceptable of the fact that you're grateful to be in a show, hit show, not show, whatever, yeah. and that you're going to glean from that experience. You're going to forged a camaraderie with people either you knew or didn't know. And then if it does get close, you're going to go straight out and audition the next day. Some, <laughs> as, soon as, that no, as soon as that notice goes up, people are auditioning all the time, you know, because that is the life of a, of a theater person. And I don't, think it's, I don't think it's fearful. I think this probably time, and I'm not there and I don't know, you know, anyone in a show right now, but I would think that this must be the most fearful time ever not yeah. to be able to reschedule a show, postpone a new and post a new date for when it's going to be open. I, I would think that that, because it's not, you're going to be, while this one is closing, you're auditioning for another yeah. one. It's going to, you it's know, gonna, it's got to play some really deep mind tricks. Plus it's going to be hard as we're all trying to adapt to this new way of living and yeah. work models and, and work, work models. Workflow. You know, how, how do we work? How do we, how, how do we enjoy a Broadway show? Uh, like I know, that. I know. And it's, it's just, um, I think that we do these zoom things and then a lot of people, you know, over the past couple of weeks have been putting on like zoom shows right. to raise money for, you know, um, Broadway uh, people and, and things like that. And, but it's still just not the same of actually being a show, you know, cause yeah. even, um, cause even Hamilton, you know, when it came on, it was great, but you also just had to be there. You know what i You just, yeah. it, it was, it was great seeing it on my TV screen, but then it still wasn't the same, you know, as actually being in the, in the theater. Right. I think, and I think that's what a lot of people feel about, the month of June and June Pride, how many cancellations and yes. postponements that we had and everything went virtual uh, yes. and, and rightfully so. Uh, yes. But this, you know, this is what we got, right? So we've right. got our Zooms, we've got our, our ways to do it and we're gonna have to make the best of it uh, and do it that way. But even though we had this June Pride go by without uh, big festivals or, or a parade, uh, I just want to talk about your support and your advocacy uh, for the LGBTQ community. Where was that born? Why, why, why is that in you? Well, that was born out of, out of Dream Girls. And, and I guess the bond was through the AIDS pandemic. Um, again, just because it hit Broadway gay community so, mm -hmm. so hard. And then I think also when you're looking, it'll be 40 years next year that Dream Girls wow. open on Broadway. And I think if you look back that what the main connection I feel with um, my uh, bond with the gay community is back then a lot of people were in the closet. A mm -hmm. lot of people were fearful to come out and would lose their jobs or their status or just be judged unmercifully or not even able to talk to uh, their, their parents, uh, 
father or, or mother well, about and also what was with going with you on. with you being a performer I, I would imagine a lot of a lot of performers were uh, afraid of talking about their sexual orientation for fear that it would somehow eliminate their chances of a bigger career i don't i don't think so not no i i never heard no i never heard anything like that um because you know broadway is kind of like old hollywood it's like it's nobody's business so you know we don't know i mean um even michael bennett had two wives i mean it's just you know it's kind of like <laughs> you know it's all part of the just, illusion yeah you <laughs> i don't think anybody thought it would do anything to their career it's just nobody's business and you just keep out of it kind of like that the old hollywood you know it's kind of yeah. like okay we can't tell because we might be a movie career but in the theater i don't think anyone kind of i've never heard any anyone be fearful of that i think that the fans real people mm -hmm. at, were themselves searching for their own existence and i think a lot of that through Effie, the character Effie, not through Jennifer Holliday, um, allowed them to feel the pain, search for where they wanted to go. Effie was uh, awkward, she was overweight, she was difficult, she was rejected on love. I think that the, the average gay person, you know, black, white, whatever, at that particular, almost 40 years ago, was a very troubled, troubled soul and yeah. torn soul, you yeah. know, about what do I do, you know? Well, and, and the, um, the biggest fear is uh, that if you do come out or if you do reveal yourself, that you won't be loved. You know, that the people that love you will not love you for your true self um, and that you will lose all of that. So in, in, instead of, of trying to be an integrated person and, and live a truthful life, you carry it around as a burden uh, because you're afraid of, of being unloved. That, and then I think just a lot of gay people felt unloved. Yeah. You know, either way. I think it was a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, yeah. That either way you were going to be an unloved, lonely person. Because mm -hmm. um, if you come out, I, you're gonna you're gonna alienate the people that already uh, have loved you. You're gonna alienate right. your family, right. and then you're also gonna be some type of pariah in open society. Uh, right. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. Reality. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, and for me, like I said, as a young lady and a girl from Texas who who knew about who who knew about gay people, sort of, but never, never right. really knew one. You know, it was almost like back then down south in Texas, you know, you know, you always had that one uncle that you knew about, maybe. Right. The confirmed then, bachelor. So, but, but in your family, they never talked about it. Like my mother said, well, I think he got a little sugar in his tank. That's about <laughs> the best, that's, that's about the best, about the best you're gonna get. But I never really saw gay people together or anything. We only maybe heard of rumors of it. Right. Um, and certainly no positive the, representation. Listen, I sang in the church, so and definitely in the church choir, you had mm -hmm. a, some thought about some of the tenors, but you never saw it. I never witnessed it. So it wasn't until I got to Broadway in my first show, uh, Your Arms to Church of the God, that I ever saw two men together, two men kiss. And then when I saw two women, that just blew me away. I was like, oh my God, I can never tell my mother she can come up here. She's gonna bring me home. She's gonna bring me home. I can never tell her what's going on up here, you know? And so for me, by the time I did turn 21, yes, I'm, I'm growing up very quickly. And then on top of this, we have this AIDS pandemic and we have yeah. so many things that I'm trying to, to deal with, you know, just as a woman growing up, young lady growing up and everything else around me. You Those know? are some real uh, formative years, you know, your early twenties and yeah, you've got a lot, you've got a lot going on, especially with instant fame. Uh, yeah. 
how difficult was that to deal with in your 20s, young 20s? Right, right. So, um, yeah, so I had just turned 21 when we opened on Broadway. And then, so I was 21 when I won the Tony Award. And then wow. only 22 when I won my first Grammy Award. So it's kind of like, I, I feel that in comparison today where there's social media and every mm -hmm. thing you do, the public wants to know about and reveal. I do think that I had some uh, privacy because Broadway was its unto itself its own world, you yeah. know, because even back then to get a Broadway ticket was still expensive, you know? So it was not everybody rushing to New York at one time. A lot of people didn't even know that my hit song, uh, and I'm telling you I'm not going, was from a Broadway show. They just they just fell in love knew, with the song. Yeah. They right. Knew the so, song from the radio. Right. Yeah. So Broadway's kind of a world away. Having to do eight shows a week, um, basically I was, you know, very disciplined, very quiet to myself because I was always thinking about my voice, my instrument, resting it. So you only have the Monday off, you know. And so you, were, you were a very serious 21-year-old. I had to be. Yeah. You're a, yeah, you're a star. Uh, and um, you have about 60 people, 30 people in the cast, and another 30 people depending on you. You can't mm -hmm. show up drunk or not able to do what you're doing or or just out of it because people, like I said, when you're in a Broadway show, the usher, everyone, mm -hmm. the doorman, everyone, janitors, everybody's counting on you uh, to make all of everything a success. Yeah. Everyone looking at their, their livelihood, their hopes also into this. So it's not just you out there by yourself as if I'm doing my concert solo act. I mean, that's you very, are a part yeah. of a of team. Jennifer, that's really deep. A lot of 21 year olds would not be that uh, mature to, to, to recognize the weight of that responsibility, to think about uh, the ripple effect of your behavior as the star of the show. Where do you think that came from? How, how do you think you were th that present to, to know uh, the impact of your role and performance and place in dream girl that well that all came from the director michael bennett and he and i were um very close and he loved the theater i mean it was no joke or anything I mean, even mm -hmm. though yes he turned out to be a wealthy man but he would have done it as most theater people have done throughout the years it's not about the money or or the fame because it's limited in terms of how many people can be the star, how many people mm -hmm. can be the, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's only a few slots in the show for the star yeah. and a few slots for the understudy, few slots, you know what I'm saying? So everybody's already accepted and come to terms. You're part of a team and you love being there. So he loved the theater and he taught me all about theater and taught me to love the theater as as well and 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 actually when he was um when he was teaching me how to be an actress he taught he would take me to see a lot of different uh plays not musicals but mm -hmm. actual plays so that uh he could uh teach me about acting and and so many uh other uh leading ladies he introduced me to or he would have me go to lunch with them and so they could tell me about the responsibility about what it was not just for myself but uh the show and the theater community um as a whole you know and even when he first started getting sick um with uh aids and he didn't really know it we went to see um Nicholas Nickleby. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but it was wow. a three night, um, yeah. a three night show. Uh, and I was thinking about it. I said, Broadway might could do different things like that because Nicholas Nickleby was, you had to buy tickets for all three nights. So, so if you can't, if you, you can't, were invested, yeah, you were invested. So if you can't, if we can't have a show that 
has a full house because those theater seats are very small, then, you know, you would ask them to buy the ticket, but then also pay for the other half. I think that that would be a great way to support the community. It's like, okay, so we can only have a half full house. Would you mind paying this so that the show can get started until, you know, things like that. But anyway, so I was back to Nicholas Nickleby and on the second night, he just kind of slept, you know, through the thing. And I was like, okay, this is not him because he, like I said, he loves theater and he loved everything and was teaching me everything about it. So I think that's why so young to have someone so much older, so much definitely invested in the theater, give his life for the theater, that it just had to rub off on me. It just had to. Is when you think about the the dedication that it's taken, uh, the hours, the commitment, the sacrifices that go into this career as being a, an actor, a, an entertainer, a singer, um, could you imagine yourself having done anything else with your life? Yes, I could. Really? What? <laughs> well, I wasn't planning on being... Um, a singer or an actress, so definitely not on Broadway, growing up in the Baptist church in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I got discovered by uh, a, a dancer uh, named Jamie Patterson, who was performing in Houston, Texas um, uh, in a chorus line. And um, he wanted to go to church on a Sunday. And so they brought him to our, our church. And he heard me singing and he said, you should be on Broadway with that voice. And I didn't really, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was like, that's very seedy of you. What are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? It's like, what? That's, oh, that's not good. You know what I'm saying? So, and at this point, I'm only 17 years old and I'm going, mm, I don't know. He says, well, if I ever hear of anything, um, you know, that could work with you. I'm going to reach out to you and, you know, and can I have your number and everything like that? And I was like, oh yeah. I said, but you know, um, I'm not grown. I said, I look grown. I'm not, but so did my you, mother would think he was hitting on you. Oh no, 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 no. Okay. I didn't, I didn't think that I, uh, fortunately I had already by that time, I've been singing the same way I've been singing since mm -hmm. I was 13 years old. So I'm not, how can I say this? What I, I'm not trying to be like brag on myself or anything like that, but he wasn't the first person that told me that I had this great voice. So I was, so okay. I didn't think, yeah, I didn't think he was hitting on me, you know? Okay. Um, uh, Cause I sang in the adult choir, even though I was a teenager. So I had been singing the same way, you know, since I was like 12 going on 13. So, so he was wasn't the first person to come up and recognize your gift. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. So, so it didn't, didn't throw me at all. So then about three months later, he does call and he says, there's this show called Your Arms Too Short to Box With God that's doing a revival. They were on Broadway, you know, in the early seventies and whatever. And um, uh, the role that you would play, the lady um, won a, a Tony Award for. And uh, it would be perfect for you because there's no speaking, only singing. And I was like, well, and I said, well, it'd be great if you could audition because I know the musical director and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, where is it going to be at? And he said, well, in New York. I was like, ooh, you're going to have to talk to my mama. I don't know. <laughs> Child, I don't know how you're going to do that. You know, and my mother, like I said, she didn't care about, we didn't talk about if you're gay, if you're straight or whatever like that. Yeah. I could have told, I was like, she's like, I'm not sending my child out with no man to go for no audition, you know what I'm saying? So he, I, we thought he accepted, but he didn't. He came back and he said, um, I have an aunt that, who is a Christian who lives in Brooklyn, New York. If, if she be the chaperone for Jennifer and take her everywhere and she stays with, can she come? And so my mother said, well, let me talk to her. And they got on the phone, I don't know what they discussed. But then I was on my way to New York. I auditioned that day. I got hired that day. And I never got back to Houston. <laughs> the rest is history. The rest wow. is history. Well, so let's talk about Mama for a second. 
How tough was mom? Well, I think that, I don't know if it was tough, but maybe how loving was mom? Mm -hmm. To say I'm not letting, even though she's close to being grown, I'm not letting her go with some man I don't know. Yeah. To a city I don't know. And uh, for something that we never heard of. We never really, we didn't know what Broadway was. Like, yeah. okay, what is that? You know? Um, I mean, so we really didn't know. I mean, that reaction from your mom, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, it's, it seems like she had a great head on her shoulders. You know, she's not, you know, she's got this daughter with a gift. You've obviously been performing, as you're talking about from your early teen years, and people have been blown away. Uh, I would imagine she would have been suspect of people and their intentions coming up to you. Yeah, and um, but she wasn't the kind of mother that was, you know, overprotective and stuff. And so mm -hmm. when I got, like I said, when I got the the job and she had to sign the contracts and stuff. And so she said, well, I'm, I'm going to send you up there. And she said, at this point, I've, I've already taught you and raised mm -hmm. you the best. And so I'm hoping that you're going to, to, you know, be, be like, yeah, follow that be like you've been taught. Life. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what was it you would have done if, if you weren't discovered? Oh, I was going to be in politics. <laughs> no way. Yes, yes. What did late, you want to do? Yes, well, um, there's still time, Jennifer, and we've nah. got no coming up. <laughs> no, 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 not during this, not during this era. Um, uh, but um, there was a a woman uh, named Congress Barbara Warden, uh, um, Barbara Jordan, and Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. Uh, who now we know uh, is a lesbian at that time, you know, like I said, sh they didn't talk about it. Right. And it wasn't until later, her latter years that she decided to come out because she fell in love with a woman and didn't want to hide it anymore. She just was going to, you know, so she just came out. But like I said, I never know any of that when we were growing up, but I did admire her. I admired the way she used words the way she spoke and i think during the watergate hearings mm -hmm. and the way she turned that out i was sold after that so i i went more so i was on the debate team i was going to do all of these kind of things so i didn't know if i was exactly going to be a congresswoman but mm -hmm. i know that i did want to do something of service in the community so maybe i would have just run for something locally first and then maybe gone. I don't know, but that that's really where my heart was. Really, I, and you yeah. had this kind of thought out. So, in high school, were you you were not doing the musicals? You were doing debate team. Doing debate team. I was, um, you know, I was second in my graduating class and fourth in all of Texas. <laughs> so, so I've worked, I studied very hard, and just really. Um, really wanted to be the best at that. So it was going to yeah. be like, go to law school, go to, you know, following that kind of steps. And I knew that, like I said, maybe start locally first to run for uh, some kind of office and then See go from there. What, yeah. what a divergent path. You know, or a judge, maybe a judge, you know, Ooh, that's that what I was thinking. But yeah, I'm, well, you're a li listen. You're a Libra too. Now you yes, know you like we balance. love balance yeah. and to be fair, yes. and we are always taking up for people. True, we like we like to be an advocate, but we also we you know, like to be love, an advocate. We love you know, attention. We love and the attention. only problem. Yeah, yeah. And the <laughs> only problem is that attention. We, we hate yes. criticism. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, so it's um, you know, that was where my 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 dream was. Wow. I think that's fascinating because it, I mean, I think you would have been a wonderful judge. Thank I think you. you would have been a fantastic politician, but boy, would we have all lost out uh, if you hadn't, you know, been discovered uh, by the dancer in a chorus line. Yeah, uh, I know. I know. And, um, my thing, like I said, I didn't want to do that, but once, once I was 
there because while I was in your arms to share to box with God, that's where Michael Bennett saw me mm -hmm. um, at the Ambassador Theater there in New York. And then he wanted me for Dream Girls. It wasn't called Dream Girls at that time. He just said he was working on something. Myself and Quiavon Derricks were in the same show. So in the daytime, we worked on Dream Girls, and at nighttime, you know, did Your Arms to Shut the Box of God. And um, at that particular point, still really, still really didn't know, still really didn't know what I was going to do. And I did at one point you know, say to Michael Bennett, I really don't think this is what I'm, I'm going to want to do because everybody was really, like I said, everybody was really grown around me. They were really yeah. all adults and it was just a difficult kind of place to, to be. Well, it, yeah. You're kind of thrust into it Yeah, from a completely different world. And this is kind of uh, a lot faster, much more aggressive. I would imagine. Much more aggressive. Yeah. Growing up really of fast. You got a lot of sharks. Really, really around. fast. And here comes, right. you know, new girl out of Texas that's going to be our lead. What? You know, I'm sure you've had a lot of people uh, that were uh, not really nice, you know, and probably maybe not rooting for you, too. Well, I don't know. I don't know about that because. Um, like I say, when you're, when you're young and you're coming in, um, the theater is both places. It's, it's, um, it is where stars are born. Broadway is where, where stars are born. Um, well, that there, there were people that were threatened by you. There had to be other female leads that were threatened by Jennifer Holliday showing up. I I doubt that. I all I, I mean because like I said the sh the first show I was in I didn't have any speaking lines just singing. Mm -hmm. And that was the revival. So the people who were like I said were olders were already established people. So I was just getting started and I did good good reviews and stuff. So then when we started with um working on Dream Girls uh like I said it wasn't until later Shirley had written in her book um in her art autobiography that she had said that I when I did come on to Dream Girls because it was a workshop and she was doing it first that it did take away her main spot in Dream Girls but she never did anything to me right. to tell me you know um whatever because I guess she was confident in her own town yeah. she'd already been in a couple of movies and stuff and she was like okay well, maybe this is not going to be my, I'm not going to be the sole star of this show, but whatever. So I didn't get a, didn't really get a lot of that. And you have to think about too, that we're African-Americans in a show and there are not a lot of shows. So we really don't have a lot of room to hate a lot of people because it's just not a lot. You no. know what I'm saying? It was a no, different. You got, yeah, everybody's got to help yeah, everybody Yeah, 40 years up. ago, I mean, you know, and I mean, it's kind of different now with Broadway. I mean, I think probably the last couple of years have been the most diverse ever in Broadway. But before that, it was called the Great White Way for a reason. Yeah. You know, so maybe they'll change that now to the Great Bright Way after we've gone through all of this right now. But but, but there was, to be quite but an, at that time. Yeah, quite an education for a 20, 20, 20, 21 year old. Yeah. Yeah, at that time, um, you know, there weren't, weren't a lot. So you just kind of learned the ropes. You listened, you sat back, mm -hmm. you kind of spoke when you were spoken to and tried to understand and get to, get to know people. So that's more of how, that's more of how I remembered. I don't remember anyone or any people having that kind of, you know, we hate her kind of thing. Cause at this point, I'm only at this point, I'm only what, 18, 19? I'm, I'm 19 at that point. So no, nobody was going to be trying to cut down a 19 year old. <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah, good thing there wasn't social media then because they probably. Yeah, social media like, is different today. They would have been trolling you there. So, you know, yeah, it would have been, of course. Of yeah. course. No, so of what do you, course. you know, this gift that you have with your voice, uh, how do you uh, protect it? How do you nourish it to this day? Is, are there are there certain uh, you know habits that you've 
kept up all these years, things that you must do to maintain that gift? Well, I continue to be extremely disciplined when it comes to my voice, uh, because like I say, in the theater, having to do eight shows a week, mm -hmm. they, they teach you how to get yourself through that. Now, I've had no uh, professional vocal training or voice lessons or anything like that. So everything, you know, I've kind of taught myself or you pick up from others or you get, you know, great tips and suggestions and stuff of how to keep you. So I think because I started in the theater first mm -hmm. that it allowed my voice to have a, a certain strength for a longer time. And so I continue to be disciplined. I don't drink, I don't smoke, um, no recreational drugs and um, just really, um, you know, no, you know, no kind of harsh yeah. uh, screaming or different things that could hurt, hurt the vocal cords. You're really responsible. You're really responsible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've never, I've never had any notes on my vocal cords, or I've never uh, bursted any, you know, veins or anything like that. I've, I've always, whatever, you know, the throat doctor would tell is say, okay, you need to uh, be quiet for twenty four hours, forty eight hours, whatever. Then I'll be quiet for twenty four hours. I don't know. Just, I don't know. I just a person that takes direction very well. <laughs> Does a day go by that you don't sing? Yeah, quite a few days uh, go by. I don't really, I'm not a person that feels like singing around the house um, because when I'm in my full glory, then I have such a big voice, right. you know? Um, but if I did want to sing a little bit, maybe hum a little bit or something like that. But what if a good song comes on in the car radio? I just listen. I, I very seldom, you know. Um, so no one's going to be pulling up uh, next to you at a red light and seeing you belting out a song? Uh-uh. <laughs> uh-uh. Uh-uh. No. And, um, and I think it's so funny because like uh if i would if i'm dating someone or something like that i think they just think i'm gonna break out in song in, in the morning or something it's what, like no you're, you're not like getting no song we expect you to live you're your life get, like a music listen you're <laughs> not gonna get no song if you want one you have to ask for it <laughs> you got to ask real good <laughs> well i i'm just curious because i would think there's still so much joy in it for you obviously you know to to sing uh or am i wrong it, it does it feel like a job well fortunately for me um i've been able to grow with my instrument so i started on broadway and at the time i started on broadway i only know i only knew really two genres of music that was gospel music and soul music so uh, when I got to New York, Michael Bennett asked me, he says, well, I want you to study Barbara Streisand. And I was like, well, who is Barbara Streisand? Because <laughs> I didn't know who she was. And of course, you know, grew to love her after I heard her, but um, I didn't know who she was. So I learned more about music. Then when I left uh, theater, started to make my own recordings. And then after that, then I started to grow, learn about jazz music, which I had never mm -hmm. heard jazz music before. So I wasn't until I was 30 something that I heard about jazz music. Wow. So in my 30s, I learned about jazz and some other music. And then um, uh, in my latter years, then I started doing more symphony orchestra dates. Mm -hmm. So then Marvin Hamlish taught me about other things to love, like Gershwin and, um, you know, just all kind of different music and stuff. So I've never, not bored yet and yeah. not tired because I'm continuing to learn about music and continue to learn how to use my instrument. Yeah, you're, it, it's great. You still have curiosity about, yes. about it. Uh, yeah. You have, a, could you pick a favorite? genre of music that you like to perform? Um, 
I would say that I have fallen in love with, with jazz. And one of the reasons I've fallen in love with jazz is because a lot of horns and stuff. So I have mm -hmm. a big voice. So you don't need brass to do jazz. You can just have a trio. But I love, you know, that power behind me, you know, the big band brass and that. So it's a good compliment. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. for someone who has a big brassy voice like mine, and and the sky is the limit with that. So I think that that's my most favorite, you know. So whether I have to sing with a trio mm -hmm. or I can have a whole, you know, uh, brass section behind me, you know, it's great. Now with with living in Atlanta now, uh, what's the career path like when it comes to whether it's uh, putting a show together or recording a new single or an album or guest starring on a show? What's the rhythm like for you now? Well, just like everybody else, I ain't got no rhythm right now because <laughs> we in COVID, pan we in COVID <laughs> pandemic area, you know, era right now. So, uh, so presses, Jennifer Holiday has no rhythm. What? Late, Lady Holiday ain't got no rhythm right now, you know. And I, like many people, um, am at a very unusual uh, place mm -hmm. uh, in, in my career. Um, uh, in terms of what is next, um, and then. You know, how will I make a, a living? Like many people, you know, this has uh, thrown the, into a great uh, financial uh, tailspin, you know, terminal, what you do. So I don't, you know, I, I don't have any uh, projects in waiting um, that I can tell you of. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things so i like many others um are kind of lost right right now yeah well mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you my my sister <laughs> my sister libra because i've been feeling that way too yeah. uh it's a struggle and, yeah. and it's, but it's good to talk about it right I, I, do, you, do you find yourself because i i i know this libra get stressed and I get deep, deep, deep in my own head. Uh, do, do you find yourself doing that too? Well, I have learned that I have to pull myself when it goes too far because yeah. so many years of my adult life, I suffered with clinical depression. And um, on my 30th birthday, I, I tried to commit suicide. And it's amazing because this year I'll be 60 years old and didn't even think that I would have lived there. And as I watch the quiet um, illness that no one is talking about is mental health. Mm -hmm. And in our industry, along with so many others, there, there have been so many suicides um, of young people, way younger than me, in their 30s, in their 20s, who've mm -hmm. taken their life during this time because it has been too much for them. So as I watch and I look, I know that I don't ever want to go there again. And so I don't allow it to get too deep. So I try to really practice to fill my head with um, a lot of reading and other positive things that I can do in my mind. And uh, because I know that I, that I don't know, want to go there, that yeah, you've got no matter how... Here. Yeah, no matter how bad it gets, that I don't want to go to the point where I would want to take my life again. So that is a starting point, and then I go from there. Yeah, because I know I know exactly what you mean about mm -hmm. the boundaries and mm -hmm. not allowing yourself to to flirt with that or right. to get low and to focus on what there is to be grateful for. Right. The, the simple things. I think that living through this time right now, it's been a great reminder of the simple things, you know, to, to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in and of itself is kind of, um, you know, the, the good buffer we all need to kind of bounce, you know, bounce away from those lows. 
because uh, for a lot of people that haven't talked about it before, there's stigma attached to talking about mental health issues. And if you haven't kind of broken the seal on that, and there's probably a lot of people, you know, they're living, you know, through our new world order that have never broken the seal on themselves and pu publicly talking to one person about any type of struggle that they've had. And, and that's really all it takes is just one person. All you got to do is talk to one person. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think that fortunately and unfortunately, this pandemic that we're all experiencing is going to force a lot of people to have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are going to have to bring the subject up in order to, to save a lot of lives. And, um, and we're not even on the other side of this. We still have a long, long yeah. way to go. I mean, it's, it's, it, we've only been in this three, what, three, almost four months, and now it's surging again. And the fall will come winter. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I can be an, um, a person when winter comes that can also kind of get a little sad because not only is it darker, <laughs> you know, it gets darker earlier and then it's just cold and it's just a whole other thing. Yeah. So I can imagine when we get to winter again, where will we be with the illness and will we have to be in again? And it might just be too long still for a lot of people. So that's my worry and my prayer that people will hold on um, and, and try to, to envision to do everything that's necessary to be done so that you can come out on the other side uh, if, if the vaccine may not come to March. Um, and then will we all be able to get it in March? Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's a lot of things we have to prepare for, but yet not be overly concerned about until that time comes. Uh, so my thing is that, I, like I said, my worry and my prayer is that they will hold on because as I look and I said, a lot of these young people who have already been committing suicide, which they will probably do stories about when we're, when we're done with the pandemic, yeah. about how many people just took their lives during this time. And a lot of them young and uh, under 40. And I, I just would like for them to not give up. This is frightening. And um, being alone with yourself can be frightening, especially if you don't know who you are, especially if you don't know, don't like who you are, especially if you're confused about who you are. It's a lot about yeah. these all hours alone, you no, know? And, and, if, and if you're unemployed, you know, add yes, that, that, add that, that layer on top it. of it. If you've lost, you've lost your job, and you're yeah, you lost your job and, yeah. and you're, you're in a position where you feel, you know, you might be humiliated because you have to ask for help. That can be a humiliating and devastating and somewhat shameful. So there's a lot of things. I, I would encourage people. I, I, I'm not a, 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 a person who journals, but during this whole time, instead of just kind of like panicking and stuff, I just bought a whole bunch of tablets. I just bought like a whole stack of tablets and I just, just start writing something about it. You know, I felt this way today and, you yeah. know, call it, yeah, call it the uh, COVID-19 chronicles or the coronavirus chronicles. Yeah, That's just smart. get it out. I just, like, cool, yeah, get, just, it out of, just, you know, get it out of your mind. Get it out and yeah. then put it somewhere. Get it out. You can date it, put it somewhere and then um search for something that is positive if it's just one thought one quote you know if it's looking out the window and you know some kind of uh flower to focus on mm -hmm. or or just anything to just stay moving forward and to hold on to hope because hope has not been canceled there's a lot of things about 2020 that we don't understand um, but this will make us all better people after coming through this. 
Um, not that we've all were spoiled these past 10 years, but in some way we have. We have just, you know, just living a life that has been so um, kind of certain or formula-like. And so now we're dealing with uncertainty. Now you're having to rely on your own strength, come up with your own creativity, things you never thought you could do. I, I mean, even myself, I was thought, I said, okay, what are some of the things that I could do if I come out on the other side of this and there is no job for Jennifer Holiday to sing, God forbid, you know, then what would I do? How will I support myself, you know, and not make it a tragedy for myself, mm -hmm. but make it a fun project. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, what, what, what the hell can you do, Jennifer? What can you do? <laughs> you know? So I think that um, we have to really, turn the word perspective mm -hmm. it's about our perspective about all of this is how we are going to be able to come out on the other side of this well i love what you said hope has not been canceled no i love that no. that could be the name of your next book okay out of these journals all right okay. now you said before that if you were dating somebody they'd have to ask you to sing and i know right. we're not dating right we haven't even physically met yet. But if I, were, if I were to have a song to go with gay good news or just like a like gay good news in, in song, how would you sing it? Ooh. How would I sing gay good news? Yeah. The word? Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, we got good news. We got good news, yeah. Gay good news. You don't have to choose all the news. Ooh, good news, yeah. Good news, turn on. Good news, yeah. Good news. I don't know. That's awesome. I love it. Woo! <laughs> Jennifer, that was great. Oh, well, I was thinking about, well, you don't have to you no longer have to choose who you are, you know, especially if it's not who you want to be, you know? And, um, and I, was, I was looking at, I would say they keep adding um, initials to this, um, to the LGBTQ. I yeah. said, okay, we got LGBTQIA. Right. And then I heard somebody say D. I said, so now what is D? I have no idea. I said, uh, if it's Atlanta, it means down low. That's all. <laughs> if it's Atlanta, it means, okay. It's, it's the first part of DL. Yeah. DL, yeah. I said, if it's Atlanta, it's a, a lot of people on the down low in Atlanta. But I don't know. But it's like, so now, you know, even though, even though all of these issues are still fraught with so much pain, there just can't be any fight for even yourself, yeah. even your marriage, your relationship or something without a fight. So therefore, I mean, hope, hopefully there's not more tragedy for transgender people or, you know, we're living in a, a cruel world. So unfortunately mm -hmm. there's not gonna be cruelty, but there's cruelty even for people you know, like we were talking about, just social media, they will just troll you for no reason. You know what I'm saying? It's just something that the anonymity allows people to, to do these things. To but go low. To go yeah, low. but so I would think that the, the gay good news is that with each passing fight, with each passing tragedy, that the right for them to choose who they want to be, who they love, becomes closer to, the, to their reach every, every day, every hour. Um, and the, the world is opening up. It's way different than 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a family member, a friend, someone who is gay, someone who is crying out to say, I need to be me. And I need to love who I, you know, I, I want to love. Or, or like that guy, what's his name? We all forgot about him now, Pete Buttigieg, you know? And then he said, well, I came out because I fell in love. Yeah. So yeah. 
So he fought for two things, fought to, to be who he was and fought for love. Mm -hmm. And that's all we will all want. We just want to fight to be who we are and we want to fight to love and be loved for who we are. Jennifer, I love you. Oh, listen this to This was you. so nice. This was so fun. Uh, I really appreciate you making time for me. I really, Thank really do. You. No, I, I appreciate you too. I'm rooting for you. I think 2020 is going to turn around. I think all yeah. of lost Libras and everybody else, we are going to find ourselves. All I right? think so too. I think so too. All right, my dear. Thank you so all much. All right. Thank you. All right. Take all care. Right. Bye. Yeah, okay. Bye. I love Jennifer Holiday, And I hope you're screaming that at home too. She was the best. And she's watching with us right now. So hi, Jennifer. I love you. I've professed my love to you several times, whether it's over the phone or it's over a Zoom or now it's over uh, the streaming show. But it was such a pleasure to meet you. And yes, we're going to put the full hour. We talked for an hour. She gave me an hour of her time. Uh, we're going to put the full hour on the YouTube channel so that you can check it out. And what about that when I'm trying, you know, tiptoeing around thinking, how can I get Jennifer to sing? And I'm like, how can I get her to sing Gay Good News? And then she just whips out a Gay Good News song. I mean, that's like incredible talent. And she didn't even blink an eyelash. She was totally on board and gave us a theme song. <laughs> so Jennifer, thank you. Uh, very much. And how cool is it that we have this platform too, uh, to have a conversation like this and to hear from a talent like that, a legend like that, uh, and her perspective uh, is awesome. Just awesome. So Jennifer, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, now, along those same lines, uh, we go from a legend like Jennifer Holiday to a new person emerging as an icon in their own right that we're going to be speaking to in our next Gay News, Gay Good News episode. You know, the very thing that everyone around you is telling you is your liability, is your service. Mm -hmm. Your queerness right. is your service. Leaning into the, your, your black sissy self will be your service. Yep. So we are going to get on Billy Porter uh, because Billy right now, he's having a moment. He's 50 years old. He's just about to buy his first house, but he is leaning in, really leaning in to who he is from the inside out. And it's working for him. It is really working for him. And I can't believe I forgot to add this. I got to get it on. But yes, Jennifer Holiday is a fellow Libra. So we also had this Libra thing going on, this back and forth of our Libra bond. Uh, that is unbreakable. She's a really good diplomat, too. We also had a conversation. I was on my way, and uh, she called to thank me for the, the gift. I sent her a thank you gift. And she called to thank me for the thank you gift. And then we got in this big conversation uh, about another topic that I should have her on for because she was brilliant on that and just, I mean, riveting. Uh, just such good stuff. Uh, yeah, I think I am a little red in the face. I laid on that unicorn a little too long, people. Yeah, uh, but I really appreciate your time. Uh, and just remember, you know, just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean that it's not happening. All right. So be safe. Have a great week. And I will see you right here next Thursday at five o'clock. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.